how do you see your life? You see it as something that's not worth living based off the things that have happened to you? Or do you see it as something that's valuable that you can use to benefit others? Hi, I'm Chris Heineken, and welcome to another great week of Resonate the Sound. And tonight's broadcast all deals with how do you see your life? Yeah. It's a question that'll make you think, but it's also a question that will challenge you. How do you see your life? And throughout this broadcast, courtesy of our associate pastor, one of our associate pastors, Christian McLaughlin, we present to you, how do you see your life? If you, if you, got, if you love taking notes, or if you never thought about that before, or need some extra motivation, here's, a, here's what we suggest for you. Grab yourself a pen, sheet of paper, and grab your, anything you need to write. Sit on down, and we're about to take you on a ride and help you see your life in a different way. Let's go resonate. But you know, most of us wake up every morning and the first thing that we do is we walk into the bathroom and we see ourselves in the mirror. There's either usually one or two reactions when that happens. One is, ah! You, scared, you get scared of your own reaction, amen? You ever been there? Like, oh, God, I look like death this morning. I look terrible this morning. Or you're like me. Man, I look good this morning. Is that funny, Ed Pam? <laughs> but most of the time, there's only those two reactions. You're either scared of what you see because you sometimes you do look like death. Your hair's all messed up. You just look terrible in the mornings. You ever been there? I've been there. Because when I sleep, my hair goes crazy in the mornings. It looks crazy. So, but you know, the way that you see your life shapes your life, though. You know, like, like I said, when you first walk, wake up in the morning, you walk in the bathroom and you see yourself. You know, your whole attitude sets your whole day sometimes of how your whole day goes and your whole day just goes about and everything. Like I said, the way you see your life shapes your life. So the way you see your sh yourself shapes how you are. How do you define life actually helps you determine your destiny? The way you look at your life has a great impact on how your life really is. A question that people are commonly asked is, how do you see your life? You know, the way, you, like I said, people say that they look at their life like a circus, a minefield, a roller coaster, a puzzle, a symphony, a journey, a dance, a race, anything. People have also described their life as a carousel, meaning that sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, sometimes you just go round and round. Life has also been described as a game of cards and that you just have to play the hand that you are dealt with. That's hard sometimes. because Sometimes we do feel like we're just going around and around and up and down and we're just having a rough time in our life. Amen? You know, if you were asked to picture your life, what image would come to your mind? Would it be an image of peace or an image of chaos? An image of love or an image of hatred? What would you consider your own life looking like if you were another person looking at yourself, how would you describe that person, that person being you, as living their life? You know, the image that comes to your mind is your life metaphor. It is the view of life that you hold in your mind. It's your description of how life works and what you expect from your life. People often express their life metaphors through clothes, jewelry, cars, hairstyles, and much more. You know, I talk very often about my car. I love my car. That's one of the ways I express my life is the car that I have because I just love that car so much. But, you know, we get too focused on our outward appearance so we completely forget about what's on the inside of us. 1 John 4 and 4 is my first scripture. It says, Yea, are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in what? In the world. And everyone must have known that scripture. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, 
but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, so your personal life metaphor influences many aspects of your life. It determines your expectations, your values, your relationships, your goals, and your priorities. For instance, if you think your life is like a party, your primary value in life is to have fun. Now, we all know most of us in here just like to act goofy and have some fun, because that's just how we are. You know, but also, if you see your life as a race, you evaluate value speed and will probably be in a hurry most of the time and miss all the great things that God has for you. If you view, view your life as a marathon, you will value endurance. And if you see life as a battle or a game winning, game winning will be very important to you if you see it as a battle because you get very competitive. How many of you are competitive? Just like playing random games and everything. You could be just a little game of Uno and you're competitive. McKenna's like, that's right. McKenna is very competitive if you didn't know it. Or a game of Dose that I just learned how to play at a family game night. I was so confused. I called that Uno's Antichrist because it was a little bit confusing. <laughs> but Dose, it was a fun game. You're like, what is Dose? Don't ask me because I don't know. But it's a fun game. But we're all very competitive when we compete in sports and any kind of game or anything. You know, I'm competitive at work, which I just started a job. So let's go to the bank. When I was at the bank, I was competitive to open the most accounts, to do the most personal loans, to do the best that I could. We're always competitive in some way or another, whether we realize it or not. But, you know, so I ask you, just to view your life, what is your view of life? What type of life metaphor do you see for yourself? How do you describe your life? Do you think it's like a race where you would just be in a hurry most of the time and you don't slow down to listen to God or just bask in his presence? Do you think of your life as a party and you all you want to do is have fun? There's nothing wrong with having fun, but are you letting your fun times get in the way of the intimate moments with God? Sometimes it's hard to keep that balance, though, because you just want to go out and act goofy and have fun. But the whole time God's like, listen to me, I'm trying to give you something here, but you're too consumed with having fun and being in the world for that moment that you're missing what I have for you. You may be basing your life on a faulty life metaphor, something that is not good. To fulfill the purposes God made for you, you will have to challenge conventional wisdom and replace it with the biblical metaphors of life. Romans 12 and 2. We all know the scripture as well. And be not conformed to this world, but be a transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're also going to look at the Amplified Version of this scripture. It says, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable, and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. That's a lot to take in. But it all revolves around God's plan for us, not our own plan. Now, the Bible talks about three different metaphors that teach us God's view of life. The first one, life is a test. The second one, life is a trust. And the last one, life is a temporary assignment. First, let's talk about the first point, how life on earth is a test. We learn this through many, out, through many different stories in the Bible. God continually tests people's character, their faith, their obedience, their love, their integrity, their respect for him, and their loyalty. Words like trials, temptations, refining, and testing occur more than 200 times in the Bible. Did you know that? That's a lot of times in the Bible, like just talk about some trials and some hard times in your life. But how many know we all go through them? Every day we're facing something a little bit difficult that we just don't really understand how to get through. But you know, God tested Abraham by asking him to offer his son Isaac. God tested Jacob when he had to work extra years to earn Rachel as his wife. God tested Job when he lost everything, everything that he had. Our character is both developed and revealed by test, and all of our life is simply that it's a test. We're always being tested. And God is continually watching our responses. He, re he watches your responses to people, to your problems, to your success, to your conflicts, to your illness, to your disappointment, and even the weather. 
I'm one, I hate storms. I am terrified of storms. So anytime it starts storming, I have a terrible attitude. Oh God, it's storming. I gotta get home. I gotta get in the storm shelter. Am I, am I lying, y'all? I'm always like that when it storms because I am terrified of storms. But God watches how I act around storms. He's like, well, that Christian, that's just a little bit crazy. But it's true. Because I could just be like, peace be still, and I wouldn't be fearful of those storms. And it would all be okay. Here I am trying to get home right real quick, get in a storm cellar. Let me just duck down for some cover over here. I'm not lying, y'all. I hate storms. And that's what I do when it storms. You're saying, well, that's just a crazy example. It is, but deep down in your heart, you all have something that you're a little bit fearful of that you haven't really conquered yet. Mine is storms. Seems simple to conquer, right? No. When the tornado sirens start going off, you better be, I'm going to be in the ground. We have a storm shelter in our garage. It's great. I don't have to go outside and get wet, get my hair and stuff. We just open the thing, get in and shut it, and we're all safe and sound. My fear that I haven't conquered is storms. Ask yourself, what's yours? And how do other people see you react to those silly things like storms? Haven't ever really thought about it like that, have you? Like something so simple, storms, that I literally am terrified of, I could always have a bad attitude over and never think about it and never repent because of that. Because I'm like, oh, it's just in my flesh to be scared of storms. But you know, your character is developed by how you handle every situation. Like I said, God watches your responses. But when you understand that life is a test, you realize that nothing is insignificant in your life. Even the things that seem to not matter as much have significance for your character development. Every day is an important day, and every second is a growth opportunity to deepen your dependency on God. Everything we face has significance in our lives, and it affects your relationship with God. God never allows the test to we face to be greater than his grace. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. Very known scripture as well. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Let me just say that again. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Isn't that just powerful? Let's read the Amplified Version of that verse as well. It goes a little bit deeper. gives a little bit more meaning. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure without yielding and will overcome the temptation with joy. You're saying, how do you do that? So that's really telling me that I should be able to just get over my fear of storms and have joy about the storms. That is hard for me because I've been terrified of storms for years. I'll tell you a little story. I was in the first grade. I was homesick from school. Anybody remember that crazy hail storm that hit years ago about that time? I was home with my mom when that hit. And we were stuck in a tiny hallway with every window in our house breaking in around us. That terrified me. My mom was literally laying on top of me, shielding me from the flying glass and the debris that was coming in the house. So ever since then, I've been terrified of storms. You're saying, Christian, why are you telling us that? Because we all have a little bit of something that we haven't let go of yet. Something as silly as just a little storm. But think of it in the spiritual side as well. How many spiritual storms do we go through that we get fearful of instead of just completely relying on God? How many bad things come our way Instead of saying, God, I don't know what this is for, God, but help me get through it. We say, oh, Lord, I'm not going to make it through this. How many times do we speak negative before we speak the blessings over our life? How many times do we forget that the death and the life are in the power of our tongue and we just begin to speak curses over our own life? It's time to resist the things. It is up to us to resist the things that are not of God. James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Hold up. You're saying, I'm going to be blessed if I face that temptation and don't give up during the temptation and rely on God during the temptation? Yes. Because for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So we talked about how life on earth is a test. 
how everything that we face is a test in one way or another, and how God watches your responses to that test. You know, it's like you're taking a test in high school or college. If you haven't studied before the test, you're going to be freaking out when they hand you the test, amen? But if you studied, like, way before, you're prepared for it, and you're not worried about the test because you know what you've studied, and you're going to remember it when you take the test, and you're going to do good on that test. Same way with us. If we don't constantly pray and seek and meditate on God and read his word, we're going to be fearful when trials and stuff comes up against us. But if we're prayed up, meditated up, and ready to go, we're like, this ain't nothing. My God is much bigger than this. And we continue to go through it without really complaining about it like we do. So life on earth is a test. Let's talk about the second point, how life on earth is a trust. Our time on earth and our energy, intelligence, opportunities, relationships, and resources are all gifts from God that he has entrusted to, to our care and our management. We are stewards of whatever God gives us. One definition of the word steward is to manage or look after someone else's property. Everything that we have is from God's. Nothing is, yes, we may own it here physically, but God has blessed us with that. Everything is his property, and we are to look after that with all the care that we can. Take care of it. Psalms 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We must trust God in everything that he gives us and everything that we go through. We are told many times in the Bible to trust God. Here's just a few scriptures to talk about that. Psalms 33 and 4. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Pro Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. That one alone is so powerful. Because our own understanding is so dangerous. So dangerous when we try to understand the spiritual and the fleshly part, that is so dangerous. We have no idea what we're dealing with if we are not prayed up and in the spiritual realm ready to go. So that's what that verse really means, lead not unto your own understanding. You know, it would be like me going into another place of work, let's say going into Barton's and trying to do Aunt Pam's job on my understanding. I would be lost trying to do Aunt Pam's job. Or trying to do McKenna's job, work at the movies. I'd be lost being in nursing school like Tyler. I'd be killing some patients probably. Do you know why though? Because I don't have the understanding that he has or she has or Aunt Pam has to do the job that they are in. I don't have the understanding. I have an understanding of doing what I do now. Well, not really because I just started in a job. So I'm building the understanding, studying to show myself approved to have that understanding. But let's refer back to me in the banking world. I was, I was in banking for five years. I have a great understanding of how banks work and how deposits work and loans and new accounts and stuff. If one of you try to come do my job, you would be lost too. Because you don't have the understanding on how to do that job. Just like I don't have the understanding to do your job. So why do we think it's up to us to work on our own understanding to do the things that God has given us? How do we think that's even right? To rely on our own wisdom and our own understanding that we have given ourselves to do what God has called us to do and to face the things that he has put in front of us. We can't. So we may just stop and pray and say, Lord, I need you to help me with this, God. Give me the wisdom to go through this, God. Not my wisdom, Lord, but your wisdom, God, to how to get through the situation. The next verse, Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And there are so many more scriptures to talk about how we just have to trust in God. You know, trusting God in everything is essential in our relationship with him. It's just like trusting your coworkers or your spouse. Without trust, the relationship becomes divided. And we should never have division with God. You know, like, like I said, I just started my job literally this week. It's my third day. But my coworkers have been great. So I'm trusting them with the knowledge that they have to teach me on how to do my job properly. But if I don't have that trust with them, I will fail. So I have to have someone that's done the job before me to learn what to do. And if I am divided against them, I'm going to fall because I'm not trusting them. Same way with God. You know, a house divided against itself will not stand. It will fall. So you must trust in God at all times through every situation. But let's be honest. We're not always like that. 
It's hard to always completely 100% trust in God. Always is. Especially, let's say just something happens, maybe, you know, you get a very unexpected bill. You're like, how am I even going to pay for this? Then you become doubtful. You don't trust God like you're supposed to. You don't trust God like we need to. And what happens then is you lose your trust in God and your confidence in God that that bill becomes late. So you don't, have, you don't trust God that he can take care of it. You try to find your own means of taking care of it. You're saying, I just thought I could handle it on my own. That's your own understanding that's just plumb dangerous to even deal with. Like I said, everything that we have is from God, and we're supposed to trust God at all times. So even if you don't like what you have, remember that God gave it to you specifically. And you must trust and know that he gave you exactly what you need in that moment of the time in your life. There's no need to complain about what you have. You may not like it. You may think you can do better for yourself. But it's perfect in God's eyes. He has provided exactly what he wanted you to have. Thank him for that. Be blessed with what you have. The last thing we're going to talk about is how life on earth is a temporary assignment. Psalms 39 and 4. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. You know, repeatedly the Bible compares life on earth to temporarily living in a foreign country. Our identity isn't here on earth, but is in an eternity, and our homeland is heaven. When you realize this, we will stop worrying about heaven at all on earth and trying to please every single person on earth. God warns us about adopting the lifestyles of this world in James 4 and 4. Yea, adulterers and adulteresses. I think I just said that word wrong, but it's okay. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enemy against God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Whoa. You're saying... You mean I can't have worldly things? It's not what I'm saying. But if you let the worldly things begin to dictate your life and overcome the godly things in your life, that's when we have a problem. That's when you become an enemy of God because you put something else above him. You put God at a lower place and put something else higher than him and put something else as a God above him. Like fame, fortune, you put that above God, you do become an enemy of God because if you become a friend of the materialistic things, Instead of godly things, more godly things, you have a problem. We have more worldly things, and our focus shifts completely to all the worldly things. That's when we're in the wrong. That's when we need to stop and analyze our life and say, Lord, where am I at? Am I putting the worldly things above you? And if I am, Lord, please forgive me. If you've got to take them away from me, Lord, take them away. Anyone ever lost anything that you'd put before God before? Hard, ain't it? Brings you back to reality. Say, Lord, forgive me. I got the big head, Lord. God, I went after this when I was supposed to go after this. Or stay where I was, but I went somewhere else. That's why you always must be in prayer and trust God in every decision and pray about every decision that you make. Every decision that you make. Because it's hard sometimes to go do what God has for you, especially when it's out of your comfort zone. I'm there right now. It's not a lie. I'm terrified of this new job. I've never done anything like this before. I'm used to the banking hours, 8 to 5, going to lunch 11 to 12, having a set pay every week, you know. This job, I'm independent. I come in and go when I want to go. I can take a two-hour, three-hour lunch break if I want to, and it's all commission. That's scary since I've never done that before. You know, the, they reached out to me back in February about this job, and I'm just now starting. Because you know what? Lots of prayer. Lots of people saying, you can do this, Christian. You can do this. God has this for you at this time. I didn't. That's hard to leave something that I'm just comfortable in. Working 8 to 5, making what I was making an hour. But God bless me with this because it frees me up to do more ministry work. It's a great potential for the Lord to bless me in that job and be a, a lot to other people that I've never been around before. But that's how, that's what we're called to do, is to always let that light shine out, always be a willing vessel unto him. 
to let him do what he needs to do through us. You know, so life on here on earth is temporary assignment. So one of our goals is to always witness people. It's all about what? Souls, souls, souls. And that is so true. So true. You know, like I said, we get so comfortable with what we're in. We're often against change that can help better our lives. Against change that can bless us. Against change that God has so much more for us. We want to stay where we just hit the ceiling in that one place. Where we can go above the ceiling and get the blessings that God has for us. You know, you're never going to be completely happy or content here on earth because this is not fully our home, you know. I read a thing once that said a fish would never be happy living on land because it was made for water. An eagle could never feel satisfied if it wasn't allowed to fly. We'll never feel completely satisfied here. It's not where we're meant to be. What this world has to offer is nothing compared to what God has for us in heaven. When life gets tough or when you're overwhelmed with doubt or when you wonder if living for Christ is worth it, remember, this is my temporary home. Things may be rough here on earth, but just one day we will be with him in heaven. We are still on the journey. You can't quit now. I'm in a journey right now in my new job. I know I keep talking about that. But it's going to be a little bit of a rough journey for the first couple months. Get used to everything. But you know, sometimes the trial and the heartaches and the pain are so much worth it. Worth so much. You know why? Because that helps you grow in him. It takes you from here up to here. You say, whoa, God, I see how you got me through that different time, that uncomfortable time. Not that it's going to be hard. It's just uncomfortable for me. How many of you have been through uncomfortable things in your life where you just say, God, I don't know. I don't know why I'm here, God. God, I don't know what you're doing right now. God, I don't know, Lord, but God, I trust in you. Lord, I fully trust in you. God, I don't know why I have to go through the pain that I'm going through at this time, God. But, Lord, help me to remember just to trust in you, Lord, because your plans are much better than my plans, God. I may not see the bigger picture, God. Just let me hold on tight to your unchanging hand, God. Recognize that everything in our life is a blessing from God, even if it looks bad. It's a blessing that helps you grow in him. Take nothing for granted. It may seem like the road is long. But just keep trusting in God and keep looking and going forward. Don't get off the path that God has placed you on. He knows exactly how rough it will get. Knows exactly how bumpy it will get. Knows all the curves and the hills you're going to go through. But it's all worth it. You know, your relationship to God on earth will determine your relationship to God in eternity. Every act of your lives has an effect on your life. You know, so I have a question for you. How do you see your life? Do you see it as living a life for God, a life of peace and love, or like I said, a life of chaos and doubt and torment and depression and all these other things? Change the way you view your life. Yes, there will be times that it seems crazy and out of control, but claim that your life is how God intended it to be because it is. He put you in your life because he knew that you could handle it. He knew that you were strong enough to handle every circumstance that you were going through. He knows what's ahead of you. But we don't. So how can you even plan for that anyway? His plan is much better than ours anyway. Stop trying to take over the plan that God has placed on your life. Start speaking life and stop speaking death. I said the scripture will go, but Proverbs 18 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Do you know what that really means in just basic Arkansas language? Watch your mouth. You ever been told by parents to watch your mouth because you've been smart enough to them? God is telling us, children, watch your mouth of what you say. You're saying, whoa, Christian, that's crazy. It is crazy. But it's true. Watch your mouth. Instead of speaking curses, why don't you speak blessings over your life? Watch your mouth. Whatever you speak will cause something to happen, whether good or bad. 
whether good or bad, if you speak negative, negative things are going to come in your life. If you want your situation to turn around, you better start speaking positive over that situation. You better say, my situation is turning around for the good in the name of Jesus. My situation is going to change for you, God, for the good, God. You know, but many times we just speak curses instead of blessings. Some of us have spoken curses over our lives and over someone else's lives without even realizing it. Without even realizing it. You know, I watched a video of Pastor Kevin Wallace talking about this same subject. He goes, some of you have even cursed your own children. I was like, I don't even have kids, but that just hit me hard. Like your daddy wasn't nothing, you'll never be nothing either. Your mama wasn't nothing, you'll never be nothing. Your brother turned out terrible, you're going to turn out terrible. And people do that without realizing the effect that it has on the person they're speaking over. You know, but it's time to come against every word spoken that has created an atmosphere of curse, an atmosphere of death. It's time to stop that. It's time to declare that we are the head and not the tail. That we are above and not beneath. That we are the apple of God's eye. That we are blessed. Nothing can take away our blessings. Declare that we are blessed. When you get up in the morning and you see your reflection in the mirror, say, God, I'm blessed. I may look rough right now, Lord, but I'm blessed. Because once I take a shower and get dressed and fix my hair, I'm looking good. And I'm blessed. Or you can just say, I look good, period, no matter how my hair looks. Now, I know I look terrible when my hair is messed up because it goes <laughs> like a tornado hit it. Just like this is really random. Yesterday, I was driving home from work, <laughs> and I saw my hair. I was like, man, my hair really looks good today. You're saying, Christian, really? Really? Literally, I was having a conversation with myself on the car. Like, man, Christian, your hair looks good today. You smell good today, which I smell good all the time, by the way. But you know, you're saying, you're stuffing seed. No, no, no. There's a difference between stuffing seed and being confident in what the Lord has made me to be. There's a difference of being arrogant and being confident and being comfortable and accepting the way that God has made you. No, I'm not perfect. We're not, none of us are perfect. I could look better. I could lose some weight. But you know, right now where I'm at, you have to be confident in the way that God made you. But many times we're like, God, I'm so fat. Why don't you just be confident in the way that I made you? I'm like, woo, okay. <laughs> All right, Lord. I'll stop complaining about the way that I look good because I know I'm made in your image. Woo. So every time you talk bad about yourself, you're talking bad about your father because you're made in his image. So every time that you speak negatively over yourself, you were speaking negative over the father who made you exactly the way that you are. Woo. Thank you, Lord. That's powerful. That is powerful. You're saying, man, Lord, I just don't like the way I look. What you're really saying is, Lord, I don't like the way you look. That's a whole other realm right there that you don't need to be getting into. Or you could just say, Lord, you made me exactly how I am, God, and I appreciate that, God. It's a blessing, Lord, to even be here on this earth, God, and I appreciate it and I love you, God. Lord, I'm blessed and highly favored. Lord, nothing that comes against me can prosper. You know, I see my life as a blessing. And we know God has great things in store for your life, even though you may not see it. So I want you to think tonight as we leave, how do you see your own life? Are you quick to speak curses and negativity before the blessings and the positivity of God? Many times we are. Many times we just speak without even thinking what we're saying. You're saying, oh, I've got a headache. Well, you don't realize what you just did. Aunt Pam gets me a lot on this one. You just spoke that headache even more into existence than it already was. It may have just barely been there, but by the end of the day, it could be migraine because you spoke it. You're saying, it doesn't work like that. Read the Bible, honey. Yes, it does. Because it's true. One night I came to church, this is at the old church, and I said, oh, God, I just feel sick tonight. And Aunt Pam, 
being at 10. So why don't you just pray over it instead of stop speaking negative? I said, oh, well. And I really think that's what I did too because I walked away from her because I didn't want to hear it, you know? See? It worked eventually when that Pam came and agreed with me and prayed with me that it would go away. When I didn't have to have that Pam pray with me, I have all the power as well. We all had the same anointing. God is no respecter of person. But I learned a lesson that night. That I spoke negative over my situation. And it got worse for a little bit before it got better. And that's what happens when you forget that the death and life are in the power of your own tongue. So I just want you to think tonight. How many times have I spoken negative over myself or over even someone else, over a situation, instead of stopping and praising God for that situation or for the way that something is? I'm speaking positive over it. What really has to happen is you have to change your whole mindset. You know, just like this guy on the picture. He's looking there, scratching his head. He's got lice. <laughs> Not really. But as you can see, he, he's thinking. Like, oh, I need to go back to bed. I've been there in the morning. I just want to go back to sleep. I'd rather not go into work today. You ever been there? I'll raise both. I'd rather not go into work today. But then, you still pull yourself together. You get in the shower. You get dressed. But since you've already spoken negative over your day, your morning starts out even worse. You're like, dragging to work. They're like, good morning. Good morning. I'm being honest. I've done this before, y'all, at the bank. Wake up so tired. And I'm like, morning. Like, What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing. Line, because I don't want to be here. You know, I'm just tired and in a bad mood. And Most of the time, though, our mood is determined by the way that we act and the things that we speak. So I challenge you in the morning. Get up where you got to go to work or you're just staying home or doing chores or something. Say, Lord, it's going to be a good day. Lord, I may not feel like it today, God, but I'm speaking blessing over my life today. I'm speaking prosperity over my life today, God. Lord, because I know that you have given me the death and life and the power of my tongue, God. And I speak blessings over today, God, over myself today, Lord. Lord, I speak great things are going to happen today, God. I may not see them at all today, God, but it's going to be an amazing day in your presence, God. Instead of saying... Uh, I just want to sleep. I just challenge you. In the morning, whatever you do after you get up, say it's going to be a good day. Lord, let people see you throughout me today, God. God, I'm not going to get frustrated today. It's going to be a great day. Everything's going to go peacefully. You're saying, well, that's just not logical. Try it. I was just try the spirit and see if it be a God or not. Just speak positive over your day and see how your day is much different than speaking negative over your day. So tonight, we learned that <clears throat> life is a test, life is a trust, and life is a temporary assignment. Also that we have to stop speaking death and curses over our own lives and over someone else's life. That's hard to change your mindset, though, to something that you're so used to doing. You're saying, well, I'm not used to speaking negative. That's negative right there. <laughs> and that's funny because it's hard to look back and examine and judge our own selves. We never want to do that. We, oh, we're never wrong. I'll be the first to tell you I've been wrong. I've done things that I wasn't supposed to do. Not afraid to admit that. But what really happens is when you just realize, God, you lead me today, God. Let me take every step in you, God. You lead me, God. And I speak positive and blessings over this day and over myself, God. Like Pastor preached, plead the blood over your day. Plead the blood over yourself, over your job, over your situation. That's what I did Monday morning when I woke up. So, God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for my new job, God. God, I plead the blood over this job, God. Knowing that you gave it to me, Lord, for a specific reason and a specific purpose, God. Lord, I plead the blood knowing that great things are going to come today, God, because that's just how good you are. Speak life. Forget the nonsense that you used to speak. 
the negativity that you used to see? Lord, how have I been seeing my life? How have I been determining how my day is going to go with the things that I speak, God? Have I been speaking more negative than more positive? And if, Lord, so please forgive me. Help me change my mindset, God, to always speak positive, God, and to see my life as a blessing from you, because it is. Hey, thank you so much for joining us right here for Resonate the Sound, and we indeed pray that the good news that was shared in today's broadcast resonated directly to you. And also, if you want more information about Resonate or our church or any other events coming up, check out our social media, social media outlets, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, very check out our website, resonatechurchar.org for all the details and all the information about our pastors, about our church, about what we stand for, any and everything. Go to our website, wrestlingchurchar.org. Hey, and why don't you join us right here next week, next Thursday, for more Wrestling the Sound. Until then, for our senior pastors, Brian and Carmen Adams, for our entire staff and everyone here at Wrestling. I'm Chris Honigan. We do indeed say to you, show love, Give peace, and here's the best part of all. Resonate Jesus. We'll see you right here next Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Have a good night, everybody.